But over the past uh, few weeks, we've been talking about uh, knowing Him. And I opened up at the start of the year uh, the first message, and then Jonathan spoke for the last couple of weeks. And uh, the last time that, that, that I looked at this subject, I want to go on from that, um, I talked about knowing God and knowing His ways. And we said that we would love to be going out of this place with joy and being led forth with peace. That that would be our heart's desire, that regardless of what's going on in our lives and our circumstances, that we come into a place where we truly get into that relationship with God, and we know that what we receive from Him, that we can go out from this place being led forth uh, in uh, joy and with peace. Love to see the mountains and the hills around us bursting into song and the trees of the fields clapping their hands, and regardless of what the devil throws at us, and you know how it is, you know the devil throws stuff at us. You know he throws it at us, and it comes from all different sections of the community and those who don't understand what God is doing and doesn't even like what God is doing. But regardless of what the devil throws at us, we're determined to see that this would happen in this particular church, and that throughout this year that we will see the joy and the peace of God being released in this place and in people's lives, regardless of the devil's attacks. We want this to be a place where the wicked will forsake their ways and the unrighteous will forsake their thoughts. We want this to be a place where the mercy of God will be revealed and the power of God will be released. We pray for people that are sick. We pray for people whose lives are broken and been destroyed for one reason or another. And we don't just want to sing about it and talk about it and preach about it. We want to see it released in this place. We want to see bodies healed and people being set free by the power of of Almighty God, a place where people can burst into song and not be afraid to clap our hands and to make a joyful noise unto the Lord because He's worthy of us being excited in His presence. So we talked about knowing God and knowing God's ways because if ever we truly want this stuff to happen in this place, we need to get to know Him we need to get past the point where we're just doing things for the sake of doing it. We can develop our own religion. We can have a go at those who are simply religious, but we can replace it with another religion. We don't want to do that. We want to know Him, but we also want to know His ways. This morning, I want to talk about knowing Him as a friend. Do you know that you can know God as a friend? So I want to talk about that this morning. If you have your Bibles or whatever you read from today, uh, stay off Facebook and all that nonsense for the next uh, 25, 30 minutes. So John 15 and verse 9. I know you're laughing at the 25 minutes there, but hey, we'll give us a bit of grace. Uh, John 15 and verse 9, looking at knowing Him as friend. John 15 verse 9. As the Father has loved me, said Jesus, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. How do you remain in his love? Well, he tells us in verse 10, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this so that your joy may be in, uh, my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends. And a lot of people stop there with things, you know, Jesus calls us friends and that's fabulous. And he says, you are my friends, but he doesn't stop there. He says, you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I have learned from my Father, I have made known to you. That's the difference between being someone's servant and someone's friend. The master will never release or reveal all this in his heart and his plans, but Jesus says everything the Father has revealed to me, I also reveal unto you. Why? Because you're my friends. Recently, listening to United Pursuit, we were driving the car with a Christian radio station on, and we were listening 
uh, to some of the uh, great songs that are out these days. And one of the songs that we sing in this church is well sung by uh, United Pursuit, and there they were singing it, and it's about the simple gospel. And it's a great song. And in that song, there's a line, and it says, I want to know you, Lord, like I know a friend. I want to know you, Lord, like I know a friend. And as we were driving and listening to that song, it then set me to wondering and asking the question, what kind of God do we want to know? Is it up to us to set the boundaries? Is it up to us to determine how we will know Him? Are we the ones that can say that this is how I want to know you, Lord? I want to know you, Lord, like I know a friend. Now, there's nothing wrong with wanting to know God as a friend. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's a great line. I love it. I love the song. And there's no doubt that that's what God is. God is a friend. And He wants to be a friend to all of us. If you don't know Him today as your friend, then you're going to get an opportunity to do that here before you leave. You see, He's not just, and this is the point I want to make, He's not just another friend. He is, and He's not just a friend who sticks closer than a brother. He is the friend who sticks closer than a brother. Solomon, in all of his search for wisdom, and he wrote that, incre that incredible book of Proverbs. And in Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 24, he said, one who has unreliable friends. Anybody got any unreliable friends? Hey, life is full of them. And they talk about their friendship. They tell you how friendly they're going to be. I'd be your friend. I'd be your friend, and I've got your back. I know many times I've heard that. Oftentimes I've said, if you want to stab someone in the back, you've got to be 100% behind them. <laughs> and we all have unreliable friends. One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin. Don't be depending on unreliable friends. They'll bring you to ruin. But then he goes on to say that there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. I want to tell you, friends, the God that we serve is a God who is beyond all other friends, unreliable, even those who are reliable, because come on, sometimes we can let each other down, even though we're the best of friends. But God, the God that we serve is beyond all other friends. He's that one true friend who will never leave us nor forsake us because that's His promise. And we actually sung about that here this morning also. He's that one true friend who will always have your back and you'll never need to worry about what's behind His back. See, true friendship is more than words. True friendship is more than just belonging to an organization or belonging to a gang, or belonging to a club, or even belonging to a church. How many mafia members have been taken out by other mafia members? Never in the name of friendship, but always in the name of business. It's not personal, it's business. How many were taken out in this country, even in this community of ours, by those who they thought were friends? A young man during the feud, one of our feuds in the community, was called by his friend, come and meet him. He made his way down through the, the narrow and dark streets. He got to where his best friend was. His best friend was waiting on him at a particular place, but he didn't know that his best friend had someone else with him. And that the person he thought was his best friend literally walked him to his death. A senior figure in an organization was invited to meet two friends of his. This man had already been shot. He was trusting no one, but his friends contacted him, and they said, we'll meet you at your father's house. He went to his father's house. They came. They knocked the door. They said, come and talk with us outside. He walked outside the front door of his father's house with his two friends down to the gates 
of the, of the walkway. Not knowing that when they got to the gate that his two friends would walk off to the side. And that there he would be gunned down and he would die. And all this stuff, it's not just the mafia. It goes on. It goes on in North Belfast, West Belfast, South, East Belfast. It goes on. But hey, thank God for church. Because that kind of thing never happens in church. We're all friends in church. We all love each other. Those people who are saying amen, you haven't a clue. But that's how it should be. We should be loving each other. Remember listening to Jack Hayford, I love the man. And he's, I think he's well in his 80s now. I'm sure some of you folks know Jack Hayford. Incredible man. I've listened to him personally something like 30 to 35 times. I've met him for 20 minutes. We had an incredible chat. It was one of the best 20 minutes of my life. And I remember listening to him as he was on television. I'm sitting at home and he's, 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 he's speaking about uh, conflicts that are based upon religion throughout the world. And then he gets to Ireland and he said, even, this is what he said, even the Christians in Ireland are killing each other. And I froze. And if I could ever challenge Jack Hayford, it would be in that one comment. In fact, I actually spoke to the television. I said, Jack, you are so wrong. Christians in Ireland are not killing each other. If they are, then they're not Christians. Christians don't kill each other. We stab each other in the back. We gossip about each other and stuff like that. But we literally don't kill each other. But when God becomes your friend through Jesus Christ, you have no need to worry about what is behind God's back. He's that one friend who's faithful to every word that he ever spoke to every promise that he ever made. And we sung about his promises today, that he keeps his word and he keeps his promises. For not only did he say, greater love has no man than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends, but that's what he actually did. In the person of Jesus Christ, the eternal God laid down his life for his friends. But he even went a step further than that, than that. Because when he died, the Apostle Paul says that was while we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. He didn't wait until we became friends. He died for us even while we were yet enemies. He's that one friend that we can turn to in every situation. That one friend that caused a man by the name of Joseph Scriven from Banbridge, just 10 miles from here, or a little bit more than 10 miles, isn't it? About maybe 15 miles, Tony? Further. All right, 24. <laughs> That's the only thing you're allowed to correct me on, Tony. <laughs> 20, 24 miles from here is a place called Banbridge, and there was a man called uh, Scriven, Joseph Scriven, who wrote this amazing hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. And here was a man who understood what it was to know God, to know Jesus as a friend. And out of that friendship, he can write this incredible hymn to let us know that whatever we're going through, that we can always talk to him about that situation and that circumstance. And so this morning, I'm asking the question, do you know him? Do you know the creator of the universe as a friend? Do you know the giver of life as a friend? Can it be said of you as, as it was said of Abraham that you also are a friend of God? What an amazing privilege and honor for Abraham to be called a friend of God. And yet that's an honor that is bestowed upon us if we also know Jesus Christ and know that friendship. See, the fact is whenever United Pursuit, United Pursuit sang and sing that song, and they sing, I want to know you, Lord, like I know a friend. They were actually singing about the fact that they really do know God 
as a friend. And again, I say, if you don't, then the great news is you can. And you can know him as a friend before you leave this place today. You can walk with God as Abraham, or sorry, as Enoch walked with him. The Bible tells us Enoch walked with God. What, 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 what an incredible picture, if you can imagine that. Enoch walked with God, and then he was not because God took him. Wow. You getting excited with that, Sylvia? Amen. He was not because God took him. But you also can have that walk with God. You also can walk with him as Enoch walked with him and walk with him as a friend. You can know him as Abraham knew him as a friend. You can sing about him as David sang about him. But here's the kicker. Here's the challenge. You see, if, if we just stop with the, about talking about him as friend, we can all leave this place feeling encouraged and invigorated. I don't want to change that. I don't want to be dragging it down here. But there is a challenge because it's not that simple. Because you can only truly know him as friend by first of all knowing him as Savior and knowing him as Lord. Put it another way, he cannot be your friend if he's not your Savior and he's not your Lord. That's why Jesus said, in verse 14 of a reading, that you are my friends if you do what I command. And so in asking, is he your friend, I'm actually asking, is he your Savior? Is he your Lord? You see, you might want to know him as friend, but you can't stop there. In fact, you can't even begin there. You must first of all know him as Savior, and you must know him as Lord. And I purposely put in Lord, because sadly, many become comfortable at knowing him as friend. And we even become comfortable at knowing him as Savior, and we stop off, he's my friend, and he's my Savior. And oftentimes, even as Christians, we stop short from really, truly knowing him as Lord do you know that in the book of Acts, and as Pentecostals, we love the book of Acts, but do you know that in the book of, La of Acts, the book of Acts, do you know in the book of Acts that, that the word Lord is mentioned over 70 times? Over 70 times in the book of Acts, you will read about Jesus being Lord but yet only twice is he referred to in the book of Acts as Savior. See, we all want to stop with Acts chapter 2 and the Holy Spirit coming upon the early believers. And we want to stop short. He's our friend. He's our Savior. But the book of Acts is filled with teaching about Jesus Christ being Lord, and we're going to look at that, get into that in the coming weeks. You'll be sorry to hear. But I want to take a few more moments before we finish. And I want to talk about knowing Christ and about knowing your possession with Him. Jonathan spoke on it last week. I want to know Him and the power of His resurrection. So I want to talk for just a few moments about knowing Him and about knowing our possession with Him. You see, we know a lot about him. We know he was there in the beginning of all things. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. No attempt to explain God. No attempt to put God into a test tube so that people can analyze him. It just makes it as a statement of fact. You believe it or you reject it. That's why we're told that it's impossible to please God without faith. You either believe or you don't. That's the starting point. In the beginning, God, He created the heavens and the earth. The beginning, time, heavens, space, the earth, the material universe. Time, matter, and space. Right there 
in Genesis chapter 1. But then we also read in John chapter 1 and verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Logos, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. With to or towards showing distinction, was God showing complete and total unity. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. All things were made by Him, not some things are not all other things as Jehovah's Witnesses would want us to believe, but all things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. We know that He was there in the beginning. But do you know Him? See, you might know that bit of information, but do you know Him? He was there throughout the Old Testament as God and Savior of Israel and remains that today. That has never changed. Spoken of by the prophets, sung about by David. You might even know some of the Psalms, some of the songs that David wrote, and we sing them in church today. One of the most famous, in fact, the most famous of them all is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And you've read it and you've sung it, but do you know him? We know he's the God who so loved the world that he gave his only son walking along the Springfield Road carrying the cross. Easter 2018, a man by the name of Peter. Where are you sitting, Peter? Wave your, there you are. So we're, we're walking along the Springfield Road on the other side of the wall. We're carrying the cross. Didn't know this man. He didn't know us. He walks up and he points and he says, John 3, 16, and I said to him, do you know the verse? And he says, I do. So he stood and he quoted it. We talked about church and we talked about the possibility of him coming along and so on. He said, I'll come to new life. Something like eight months later, three weeks ago, he came to this church. <laughs> and he gave his life to Jesus Christ. You see, he knew about him. He, he was able to quote the verse, John 3, 16, but standing on the Springfield Road, he didn't know him. Now he does. See, so you can know about him, you can know the verses, you can know the songs, but you need to know him. You can even walk with that cross, John 3, 16, as we've done hundreds of times, literally hundreds of times over the past number of years around our dividing wall. And you can even do that and yet not truly know Him. See, it's good to know about Him. When you truly know Him, then life will never be the same again. That's why it's good to know about Him, but even better to know Him. In fact, the message that I brought a few weeks ago was that we need to know Him, but we also need to know about Him. It's not enough to simply say, well, I know Him. What do you know about Him? What kind of God do we serve? Do we want to honor with our lives? So we know about Him, but we also need to know Him. But when you know Him, I want to tell you, friends, when you really truly know Him, you will never go back to the life from whence you came. When you really truly walk in that relationship with Him, there's no going back. Oh, we stumble, we fall at times, but there's no going back. When you know Him, you don't go back to the wells that the world has to offer and drink afresh from its water. Even Jesus said that when you drink from the world or from what the world has to offer, then you will thirst again. But he says if you drink from what I have to offer, then you will never thirst again. Friends, if you truly know him, you will not want to go back to the needle. If you truly know him, you will not want to go back to the streets of loneliness. And I know there are people in this church and other places and you walk the streets of Belfast and you, and you meet with those that are lonely for one reason or another. We can, and we can discuss and we can analyze the reasons behind it. I don't do it that often, but we did it. You saw the post that we put out on Facebook during the week. I don't put it out to say, hey, look what Jack McKee did. I don't go onto the streets at nights. I did for decades walked the streets of the Shanker Road, went onto the Falls Road, 
walked up and down the Falls Road, stopped people, giving them tracks, talked to them. A guy who was in the UDR, out of uniform, on the Falls Road, giving tracks to people, talking to them about Jesus. The most hated organization in West Belfast. There's Tom, Tom, good to see you, brother, from West Belfast. At one time, we were enemies. He sent me a message last night, said, Jack, you're my friend, we're friends. Because that's what it's about, and it's God that does that. Tom told me one time, he said, Jack, we hated you more than we hated the paratroopers. That's what he told me. But I'm walking along the Falls Road, giving out tracts, talking to people about the Lord. I've done it all, and there's still much more to be done. I'm not finished with that. But I'm simply making the point that I don't put on a, a, a coat and a hat and scarf and gloves. I gave my good gloves away a couple of nights ago also. But I, I don't do I, I, It's not what I do. Some of you do it regularly. But we decided to go out a few nights ago. And some of it, just those moments, were heartbreaking. And yeah, we can, as I say, we can analyze it and give reasons why they shouldn't be there, but they are there. One girl who sat in our church for years, I didn't even recognize her. I was her pastor. I sat in her home with her husband and her children, and now she's sitting on the steps of a cathedral that, that has its doors closed. We got her into somewhere to stay that night. But I tell you, whenever you really truly know him and you walk with him, you will never go back to those streets of loneliness. You will stay in fellowship and relationship with him. And when you fail to truly know him and understand what he's about, then there'll come those moments where it will be so easy to walk away from him. And I'm encouraging you today, dear friends, get to know not just about him. So you're not just singing the songs and quoting the verses but you really know him so that you can leave that needle to side. You can get up off those streets and get back into fellowship and relationship with him. If you truly know him, you will not go back to that chair. Sylvia, where's, where's those hangers here, Sylvia? Thank you. Ah, you were going uh, you, you to bring them up and somebody told you not to. <laughs> Thank you, Sylvia. I meant to bring I'm going to bring some myself. But, thank you, but when you truly know him, she's a gem. But when you truly know him, you'll not want to go back to the chair that you walked away from at one time. And there are people sitting in this church and you were at that chair. And thank God for what he's done in terms of, of turning your life around and you're now walking in fellowship with him. If you truly know him, you will not go back to the bombs and the bullet or back to the gun. The thing that made you feel that you were the person with power and authority and there are a lot of people in this church who are in that position at one time. Even the girl that gave me the handkerchief. Amen. Praise God for what he does, Sylvia, on people's lives. If you truly know him, then you will not go back to the prison cell or to the thing that got you there. And thank God for the people in this place, yes, who were there physically, but also whose lives were being controlled and hemmed in by the circumstances and the things that dominated your life as your life has completely turned around. And when you truly know him, You'll not want to go back to those places. For if anyone, thank you, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. All things pass away and all things become new. And so thank God for the many in this place who have had that new start in Him and who not only know about Him, but who also know Him. And here's the point. If you don't yet know Him, you can, and you can begin to know Him today by accepting Him as Savior and as Lord. Let me finish now, and just, I'm going to finish in just a moment, because I want to leave this point with you. See, it's good to know Him, but we also need to know our position in Him. 
You were told in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6, Paul tells us about Christ having descended, and I have my own theory about that, descended into the depths of the earth. He wasn't lying in the tomb for those three days. He was taking the devil on in the devil's headquarters in the devil's territory. But anyway, Paul goes on to tell us how that having descended, he ascended to the right hand of the Father. To the right hand of the Father. But then Paul goes on to say how that we also together in Him are seated with Him. So together we're seated in Him. Where is He seated? He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Where are we seated? We are seated at the right hand of the Father. Where is Jesus today? He's seated in the place of power and authority. Where are we seated? We're seated in the place of power and authority. All things are under His feet, therefore all things are under our feet. I want to tell you, friends, the devil should know your shoe size. These, these boots that I'm wearing, Jonathan doesn't even know my shoe size, Gemma. John and Gemma bought me these boots for Christmas. They bought me a size 8. They didn't even know it took a size 9. I got bigger feet. <laughs> so we went and got them exchanged. But I want to tell you, no matter who does or doesn't know your shoe size, the devil should know what size of shoe or what size of boot you wear. Because we're seated with Christ. All things are under His feet. Therefore, all things are under our feet. So the next time the devil comes and has a go at you, the next time you want to put on Facebook, I'm having a rotten day. I'm having a... Hey, hey, see next time you're going to put on Facebook, I'm having a rotten day. Tell him you go to Whitewell or somewhere. Just just mention, come on, new lifers. Let's get above it, new lifers. Let's get above it. Let's recognize that we're seated with Christ. Let's defeat the devil. We can because he is already defeated. You're not asked to defeat someone that needs to be defeated. You're asked to defeat someone who's already been defeated. Let's recognize our possession of Christ today. We need to know him. Know him as a friend, and he will be an absolutely amazing, wonderful friend. But you've got to know him as Savior, and you've got to know him as Lord. And when you do, it's not about him being up there somewhere over over your life and controlling you. It's about you being with Him and walking with Him through life.